At the dawn of the 20th century, Vietnam was part of a massive French colony called Indochina. Since the very beginning of the French conquest of Vietnam in the mid-1800s, a Vietnamese nationalist movement of some form or another had struggled for independence. This struggle would eventually land Vietnam right in the center of the titular clash of this channel. Let's tell the story of French Indochina, the prologue to the Vietnam War. I'm your host David, and this is The Cold War. To tell the story of Vietnam's struggle for independence, we should first talk about Japan. For many people living under colonization in Asia, Japan in the early 20th century was seen as a model to aspire to. Here was a country which resisted colonization. It was on the path to hold its own as one of the great powers of the world. Japan even shocked the world in 1905 by defeating the Russian Empire in a war for Korea and Manchuria. In Japan, a Vietnamese scholar named Fan Boy Chao became the leader of a nationalist movement resisting their French overlords. France managed to pressure Japan to deport Chao to China. There, he bore witness to the end of the last Chinese imperial dynasty and the beginning of a short-lived republic. In the chaos of the end of the early republic and the Chinese Civil War, which you can learn about in this previous Cold War video, French spies captured Chao and took him back to Vietnam. They forced him to live out the rest of his life under house arrest. By keeping him alive, he couldn't become a martyr, but while well under French control, he was also unable to organize any resistance. But in 1940, Japan invaded French Indochina. To any of the Vietnamese people who wanted to be free, being torn between rulers in Paris or Tokyo didn't matter a whole lot. It didn't help matters when the Japanese more or less set up a puppet government there. They held this puppet Vietnam afloat using a complacent Vietnamese emperor. Enter a new Vietnamese nationalist leader, Ho Chi Minh. He had been present at the Treaty of Versailles at the end of the First World War. Ho's delegation effort was to ensure civil rights for the Vietnamese. But they were ignored. All Wilson's words about self-determination and freedom, it became clear, only applied to white people. So without the US's ideas of liberty to guide a better life for the Vietnamese, he turned to the only country which would accept a young, anti-colonial socialist. He went to Moscow and the fledgling Soviet Union. There, he received a socialist education and in 1924, went to Guangzhou in China to give lectures to Vietnamese rebels living there. When Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang turned on their communist allies and members in 1927, Ho wound up in exile. He moved around the world until he landed in Shanghai in 1930. There, he chaired a meeting which unified various socialist Vietnamese currents into a single party. After another brief time in prison, this time courtesy of the British in Hong Kong, Ho returned to Moscow in 1933, where he worked as a professor at the Lenin Institute. In 1938, he returned to China to advise the communist forces. Under Japanese occupation, Ho returned to Vietnam to push for independence. There, he formed a resistance organization, the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh was a coalition of independence movements from across the political spectrum. He pressured against Japanese rule and urged the international community to make sure France did not retake Vietnam after the war. But after Roosevelt's death in 1945, the US began to back away from that idea, preferring French rule to self-rule. After the armistice of the Second World War, France wanted to re-establish their colonies. They wanted to recover from the war and remain relevant on the world stage. As the Japanese retreated, the Viet Minh were able to take over public buildings and public works, giving them firm control over the governing institutions of Vietnam before the French could reassert themselves. It only took until September of 1945 for a combined Free French and British force to land in Saigon and attempt to impose martial law. Their mission was to accept the Japanese surrender. This is when the losing side of a war turn over occupied lands to their victors. As per the Potsdam Conference, Kuomintang soldiers pushed south to accept the Japanese surrender down to the 16th parallel. Chiang Kai-shek decided to use the tense situation in Vietnam to return this land only under the condition the French turn over ports they had colonized in China, including a famous one in Shanghai. The French agreed, but the Kuomintang left behind a Vietnamese branch of their army called the Vietnam Quoc Dan Dang, the VNQDD. 
they were vulnerable and were attacked by both French and Viet Minh soldiers. Soon enough, with the VNQDD out of the way, the French and the Viet Minh were at war with each other. Fighting broke out in the coastal city of Haiphong. A disagreement which escalated into a battle over import duties exploded. It began with a French naval bombardment which killed around 6,000 civilians. Fighting broke out across the country. While the Viet Minh had superior numbers, they could not combat the firepower the French possessed. The conventional war ended with Ho and the Viet Minh retreating to the countryside. From there on, they relied on a tactic which they mastered and will become important for the Vietnam War later in the century and this series, guerrilla warfare. The Vietnamese launched an insurgency against the French. They never met the French in head-to-head -head combat, instead preferring to bleed the French dry through slow attrition. After nearly two years of a frustrating and unsuccessful cat and mouse game, the French tried a different tactic. They decided to attack the Viet Minh by setting up a rival government to challenge them. Instead of Ho's proposal to make Vietnam independent, this government would be loyal to the emperor. The emperor would keep Vietnam under the sphere of influence of France and within the French Union of Nations. It's sort of an attempt at a French version of the Commonwealth. They gave this puppet Vietnam quote-unquote independence in 1949, along with Laos and Cambodia. The French hoped to provide the Vietnamese with enough independence to feel free while still maintaining the hierarchy over them. Here's the problem. Another major event happened that same year to the north in China. After a decades-long civil war, which you can watch on our video about here, the Communist Party of China became the ruling government of the majority of the country, save for the island of Taiwan. Now, to the north of Vietnam was this new People's Republic of China. The Communist Chinese were good friends with Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese, and the Viet Minh soon received Chinese irregular troops and were ready to go on the offensive. Beginning at Vietnam's northern border, they began to attack French troops. The US started to support France with both money and munitions. Now, this colonial independence movement was truly part of the Cold War. The US and UK gave recognition to France's puppet Vietnam. The Chinese and Soviets recognized Ho's government. But at this point, the world's eyes were further north of this conflict. Around the same time, the Korean War had broken out. Another story for the Cold War Channel. Between China, Korea, and Vietnam, the US feared that if they didn't put all their effort into stopping the spread of communism into Asia, like a line of dominoes, they'd all fall. This domino theory would get the United States mired in many costly conflicts in Asia. Conflicts they had little hope of winning. They were fighting for geopolitical control, the Vietnamese were fighting for their home. One could retreat, the other could not. That changes the lengths you'll go to to win. Of course, these are conclusions that are easy to make in hindsight. This story was similar in France. Despite winning many battles, they could never defeat the Viet Minh. They'd retreat, going into the endless wilderness, crossing over into neighboring countries, and attack the French army's vulnerable spots. The French were playing chess and the Viet Minh were playing Go. In 1953, General Henri Navarre reported to Paris the war for Indochina was unwinnable. The best case solution for them was a stalemate. By 1954, the war was growing unpopular back in France and calls were being made to abandon it. In April of 1954, a conference in Geneva began to sort out the situation in Indochina and Korea. In this agreement, the global community decided what to do about the collapsing French Empire in Southeast Asia as well as the war in Korea. The last battle of the war was the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. The French, with supplies cut off and vehicles stuck in monsoon mud, were overwhelmed by Vietnamese soldiers. This battle changed the game at the conference. The victory gave the Viet Minh much more of a bargaining position. They agreed to split Vietnam temporarily in two at the 17th parallel until an election could be held in 1956. There, the Vietnamese would determine how they wanted to live. Let's say the US, despite being part of this agreement's creation, didn't sign into it. The US and South Vietnam had no intention of agreeing with the election results if they didn't go the way that they wanted. The Southern Republic of Vietnam refused to allow for elections to take place. Seeing no elections, the Viet Minh began to prepare for a continuation of their war for liberation, this time against the US-backed government in Saigon, what has popularly become known as the Vietnam War. Of course, we here at the Cold War Channel 
we'll be covering this in detail in future episodes, so be sure to press the bell button to subscribe to the channel. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War. My name's David, I've been your host, this is the Cold War Channel, and we will catch you on the next one.